What are you doing? Ghostlight wanted to pre-screen my nudes. everybody, this is Joseph Garden and welcome to Cook Henny, where we explore the creative and connective powers behind food. This week, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite things. That's right, the only thing more supple than these hard strings, girl. We're talking about the poetry of pasta, the nuance of noodles. We're talking about the compassion of carbohydrates. This week, we're sending nudes, Henny! Oh, I didn't see you there. Oh, you wanna know a little bit about noodles? Sure, I can help you out. Let's get into the history and of the human relationship with noodles. So this relationship unfortunately begins quite rocky with a love triangle. That's right, for as long as humans and noodles have coexisted, there has been a debate about who invented the noodle. Now, most people understand and know the debate that exists between Italy and China. Italians say they invented it first, Chinese say they invented it first. However, there is a third party that often gets overlooked in this debate, and that is the Middle East and Maghreb region, which is the northern part of Africa that is often considered a part of the Middle East uh, because of their uh, Arabic influence and Muslim influence. Now, some people are sitting here thinking like, the Middle East, bring pasta to Italy, that's where it all started. That seems interesting because we don't often think of noodles and pasta as an aspect of Middle Eastern cooking. However, think about it. Things like couscous, rice pilaf, they even have a mac and cheese dish uh, that is kind of a, a bechamel sauce in noodles that originated in Egypt. So these dishes we, we know exist and they were carried over to Italy. And that is what most uh, food historians believe. That is isn't until 2004. And man, when somebody brings receipts, they bring receipts. And we know what receipts can do to a relationship. It changes everything. So the first documentation of a noodle was 2,000 years ago and it was documented in a manuscript. However, in 2004, in an archeological dig in Legia, China, they found, you guessed it, a preserved bowl of noodles. How flippin' amazing. I want to buy fossilized noodles. Does anybody else out there want to buy themselves some fossil? I want a bowl of fossilized noodles up on my shelf. But they found a bowl of preserved noodles. Um, they believe they were made from millet, uh, and they found it in this archaeological dig, dating back 4,000 years. So I don't know the answer to the debate. All I know is that this love triangle flourishes when it comes to me thinking about noodles and humankind. And I don't care who invented them, but all I want them to know is thank you, I love you, you're brilliant. This relationship now consists of thousands of varieties of pastas and noodles, mostly made from wheat, rice, or beans. However, buckwheat, millet seed, and even root vegetables like potato have been used to produce different types of noodles. In Japan, there's a common noodle known as shirataki, which is made from the cognac root, and it is naturally a low-carb uh, and low-calorie noodle. So if you are on a diet, girl, or you try an add keto mess, go ahead, get some of those noodles, and give them a try. They're good for you, they're healthy, and you can get your noodle fix. <laughs> In America, our tastes have evolved and moved on from the traditional Italian-American and Italian pastas. We've now began to explore in our cuisines, in our restaurants, the powers and wonders behind a lot of Asian noodle varieties. Rice noodles, uh, bean noodles, and even your chow mein noodles. I have my noodles here. I am ready to go. And remember, girl, the thing about cooking noodles is, ooh, she basic, honey. Love noodles. Love, love, love noodles. And I use the word noodles because my love goes far beyond pasta. I don't think there's been a noodle I've been introduced to that I do not love. I love chow mein, lo mein, Singapore style noodles. I love ramen, pho, every type of pasta possible. And yes, I think there is a difference between the different types of pasta. Um, and I, and I love each and every one for what they offer, how they hold sauce, 
uh, how they treat the dish and the palate. I think my love affair with pasta started with my dad's magic noodles. Now, I was the one who called them magic noodles. It was really just top ramen. But often my mom would cook dinner for us. Actually, she cooked most of the time. However, there were rare occasions where my father had to cook. And when he did, he made top ramen. And my dad, being the eccentric person that he is, where do you think I get all this from? He couldn't leave it at just the packaged top ramen. He would add pepper flakes and seasonings and uh, Worcestershire sauce and all of that great stuff. He would let it all boil up and he would serve that to us by the spoonful. Why I called it magic noodles is I have always been a fat kid at heart and I would always want some more, but unfortunately we only had so much. And so, um, you know, when you eat top ramen, there's all the little straggler noodles. My dad would take the bowl back to the stove, scrape my straggler noodles down to the center of the bowl and give it back to me. And I always thought like, wow, these noodles are magic. They're always just as a little bit more, or a little bit more and a little bit more. Um, and he would always just kind of hide that little magic from me. Um, but it's something that I, I loved. Um, as I grew up, my taste for noodles grew and expanded past that sort of overcooked goulash noodle um, into more sophisticated al dente pastas and Asian style noodles. Um, I'll never forget the first time I had chow mein and what a, just a flavor rush and a change of um, experience that was for me. So today I would love to teach you guys the three basic styles of cooking noodles. That's boil, soak and steep, and stir fry. Now I can't really just do this without really expressing my love for noodles. So with each of these I'm also going to provide a simple dish that you can kind of cook with those prepared noodles. And these dishes are near and dear to my heart. They're a part of my childhood, um, they're a part of my growing up, and they're a part of my love of noodles. So the first method I'm gonna show you is your basic boiling method. We all use this when we make pasta, or macaroni and cheese, spaghettis, all of that great stuff. All you're going to need is pasta, salt, and some water. Now I already have some is pasta, salt, and some water. Now I already have some water going in my pot just because I didn't want to take forever to boil. See that nice steam? But I wanna show you guys kind of the proper way of boiling your pasta, cooking that pasta. So I'm gonna add my water. I'm gonna go ahead and move this behind me in my sink. I'm gonna add my salt. Now, there are two reasons why we add salt. Yes, you add salt to season your pasta. And a lot of people say, well, I'm gonna dump my pasta in a pile of sauce. Why does it matter if it's seasoned? Well, this is just gonna add a little bit of salt to that bite. Let me go. The second reason is, is actually very scientific. Salt hires the boiling point of your water, which means your water is hotter, which allows the pasta to cook faster and more efficiently. So you're gonna go ahead and add that salt in there. Then you're gonna to wanna to take a taste. And my favorite quote I have heard about salting pasta water is, taste your pasta water. If it tastes like it has a lot of salt in it, add a pinch more, add a little bit more. So we're gonna take it further. We're gonna add just a little bit. Do a little hand, ooh, like magic sprinkles, 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 okay? That's it. So I'm gonna give that a stir, I'm going to cut buy my salt to my water, make sure I got some nice seasoned water. Now here is another pasta lie that you've been told. Yes, you've been told some pasta lies. The biggest pasta lie is that you have to wait for your water to be boiling. That is not true. Uh, you can actually just add your pasta in now. Scientifically, when they did a bunch of trials and studies with pasta and starch and how the starch releases, they actually found no difference in starting your pasta in cold water and letting it come to a boil versus just letting it boil and come to, uh, and then put your pasta in and just kind of let it um, cook down. There was no difference. Another uh, difference that's a lie is you don't need such a big pot and you don't need so much water. If you actually just have about a half an inch um, to a, I would even say maybe even a quarter to a half an inch over your pasta, you're gonna be fine in the boiling process. The noodles actually don't soak up that much water. So I'm gonna add my pasta in now. Another trick, 
you can actually use a skillet to cook your spaghetti. That's right, cook it in a skillet, you expand that surface area of the water, you shrink the distance, um, the, the height of it, so you can then cook your pasta faster if you're in a rush. Why you add extra water and why a lot of times when people are teaching you to make pasta, they want you to add a lot of water, is it um, dilutes the starch that gets in the water. If you don't have very much water, you might have had this happen to you. You're boiling your pasta, the pasta boils over. Grab my spaghetti. Now, people talk serving size of spaghetti. And if you have one of those like spaghetti spoons, um, that hole is technically, that hole is technically one, shoot noodles all over the house, uh, is one serving. A serving size is about the size of a quarter. This is one serving of spaghetti. It's about a quarter when I hold it like that. You can use that as a um, guide when you're making pasta. So one quarter handful for each person coming and it'll kind of help you uh, distribute your pasta. I'm gonna go ahead and drop that in the pot and this pot's big enough it just lays down in there. I'm gonna put my lid on it just to let it come uh, up to temperature and get hotter. All right, so we're back. I have removed the lid from my pot. My water's nice and hot. My noodles have become a little bit bendy here. You're gonna wanna make sure once they start to soften up to give them a stir. Those starches are very much like glue. And if you've ever had your pasta stick to the bottom of the pot or together, that's what's happening is it's releasing those starches and then it's gonna start to glue together. This is the time when you wanna give it a nice move uh, around the pot, let it swim around in there in a nice hot water and then that'll prevent your pasta from sticking. And really All right, so our pasta is getting really close to done and I really wanna remind you, it's super important not to undercook or overcook your pasta. Undercooked pasta is gonna either still have a crunch it's not gonna be as flexible, or it'll have a chew to it, where that center was just starting to soften up, but now you have to chew your way through it. Nobody wants to chew their way through their pasta. It should have a bite. You should um, have a nice bite into it, but you shouldn't be chewing or crunching. You also don't wanna undercook it. That's when it's just gonna become this mush. It's extra soft, almost gooey. The noodles have expanded. If you're using like elbow pasta, they crack open a little bit, split open. Nobody wants kind of overcooked pasta. Texturally, it's gross. It's not gonna be able to soak up or stick into your sauces. And that's what we really want is we want this pasta to be a vessel for whatever sauce you're going to prep it for. So, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you. Notice there's flex. If I take it and pinch it in half, it doesn't break. Okay, it's nice and flex and stringy. This one that I didn't play with, let's take a bite. Still too much chew. It's kind of stuck on my teeth. It needs to soften up a tad bit more. I'm gonna say this needs another minute. The last thing I wanna tell you is you should always take your pasta after you've drained it and stick it in your sauce. Um, at that point, it's really still sticky and it's gonna allow the sauce to adhere to the noodles. You should cook your noodles kinda and stir them around in a minute in your sauce. That's really what brings pasta to life. These are gonna be just about ready. I'm gonna go ahead and drain them and then we're gonna make one of my all-time favorites. Uh, this was a simple dish my mom would make when we were hungry and she needed to make something quick. It was also a dish that I have memories with throughout my childhood of just kind of a comfort food. It was also one of my favorite little quick college dinners when I had been studying and I didn't want ramen or something from a can, I would do this. So I'm gonna make simple butter garlic noodles. All right, so let's drain our pasta. I'm gonna go ahead and turn. I have my nice colander set up. Ooh, fancy. There we go. This is gonna beep at me because there we have it. Lovely cooked pasta, no bite, al dente. Now, like I said, we're gonna go ahead and make that butter and garlic sauce. We're gonna start by melting three tablespoons of butter into our cast iron skillet. Get it nice, hot, steamy, melty. Mm, look at those bubbles. Then we're gonna go ahead and go in with our garlic. We only need about three uh, cloves of garlic. You could also use some garlic salt if you don't have fresh garlic on hand. Get that all melty, get that golden brown. I'm adding a pinch of salt because I'm using unsalted butter to add flavor and heighten the taste of garlic. 
then go ahead and add your noodles. Now I should have added about three tablespoons, two tablespoons of pasta water at this point because it would have helped emulsify the butter and made this nice creaminess, but I had already drained my pasta and forgot about it. No big deal. Again, we make mistakes in the kitchen. Then we're going to stir that around, get it all nice and coated with the butter, butter and garlic. Then we're going to simply plate, serve. Mmm. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that butter garlic pasta. It is one of my childhood favorites, memories. I love that. A uh, few um, late nights in college definitely resulted in some butter garlic noodles. Now just know if you want a healthier version of that dish, you can use olive oil instead of butter, and you can use, um, for even more ease, let's say you don't have fresh garlic, you can use garlic salt and make it that much uh, just simpler. I kind of want to walk you through my childhood, and to do that, I'm going to make the next noodle dish, which I loved as a child, uh, and I'm going to show you how to make something called sapa soy, or Polynesian chop soy. Now, I have told you guys, my uncle is Tongan, and so growing up, he would make this for myself and my cousins. It's a really great, simple, salty dish with just a thick soy sauce, onions, uh, ginger, some chuck uh, roast chopped up, and glass noodles. So Brandon Esman wanted me to do something with glass noodles, so I'm giving him a little glass noodle dish. And then over here, I have rice noodles or rice sticks. I want to show you both of these just, I don't know, because I have them. So these are more for like pho um, and things like that. And this is more for um, sort of, you can use glass noodles for anything. They cook clear, so they kind of take on whatever color you put them in. Um, they're kind of a fun noodle. They're going to uh, have an interesting texture. This is made from bean thread. The texture is going to be kind of um, almost gelatinous, I guess is the best way to describe it, where this is going to have more um, of a traditional, almost pasta feel like that pho noodle that you're used to. So to steep our soak is simple. Steeping is where you take boiling water. You're going to dump it on top of these. You're going to let them set for however long the package recommends. Please listen to the packages on that. Most of these noodles, if you're using bean thread noodles or rice thread noodles, remember noodles are typically wheat, uh, rice or bean. The bean thread noodles and rice uh, thread noodles will have soaking directions on the back. It can be anywhere as quick as two to three minutes, but as long as 15 to 20 minutes. Um, the, I find that the rice um, sticks tend to take longer than the bean um, curd thread. All right, so my water is boiling. We're gonna go ahead and uh, steep these noodles. I'm gonna grab my mitts, grab my water, and then you're just going to dump the water in just enough to cover. All right, so these have the hot water on top of them. They're steeping. While we do that, why don't we go ahead and make the base for our sapa soy? We're going to start with two tablespoons of oil heated in the pot and a quarter of an onion chopped. We're going to go ahead and get that translucent before we add our garlic and ginger. There's two cloves of garlic and one tablespoon of ginger. Go ahead and let that get all nice and caramelized in the pot before you add half a pound of chuck roast chopped. You're going to lightly brown that and add water because the recipe does call to steam it with the lid on. Get all those juices mixing around meat cooked. All right. So these glass noodles have been steeping for only a couple minutes, but they are ready to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and drain them and show you what they look like. Those are a bit long for sapa soy, so we're gonna chop them up with some scissors before we drain them, give them a shake. Oh, wrong side, pretty side, and finish. So as you can see, they kind of look collectively white. Let's see if I can step up closer. But you can kind of see there's a clearness through them. They look glass-like. And these are glass noodles. They're soft, supple. Like I said, almost a gel-like texture to them. Not as gooey as gel, but like there's still bite like pasta, but it's definitely more of like a, uh, like a gummy texture. And so then these would be great further boiled in some sapa sweet which is what we're gonna do. We'll throw them in the sapa sweet pot. Or um, you can put these as a base, throw some sauce on here, and just kind of toss it with them, and these are ready to go. That meat 
should be thoroughly steamed by now, nice and brown. Go ahead and give it a stir before you add in your thick soy sauce. You can make your own with light soy sauce, cornstarch, and sugar. Mix those things together just enough to cover the meat. Then, when it's nice and bubbly, you're going to add your glass noodles. Give them a stir. Keep adding. Stir them in. I'm checking to see if I have enough. You don't want to dilute it too much. Plate. Serve. Oop, got a fork. All right, so I have those rice sticks here. Uh, they're cooled down and drained. They're going to be slightly opaque, but they're going to have that nice, like a whiter color to them. Nice, soft, and simple. I know some of you guys might have clocked the new pot. Don't worry, old girl's still in commission. Here she is. Um, I'm boiling water for the next experiment. Jump to, but... She's still here. My bigger stock pot, uh, the enamel wore down on the inside and got a rust spot. So now it's going to be upcycled into a planter and I had to get a bigger pot. But don't worry, Old Faithful, she's still here, ready to go. So I hope you guys have enjoyed my little journey through my love of noodles. We have gone over boiling noodles. We've gone over steeping and soaking uh, noodles. And now we're going to go over one of my favorite methods, stir frying noodles. Uh, these are things like your chow mein, or if you were ever around or grew up around Filipinos or were invited to any Filipino parties, panset, which is one of my favorite dishes. Um, I have so many fond memories with um, panset, and my earliest panset memories go back to my good friend Corazon, who lives in San Francisco now, but she would always have parties and gatherings, and her mom made the best fun set I had ever had in my life. Just so full of flavor, so delicious, so mouth-watering. Um, and actually, fast forward later until after college, I actually ended up living next door to Corazon's parents, and I'd be out working in the backyard. And there were several occasions when her adorable little mother would peek her face over the fence and go, Psst! Psst! Joseph! You want some noodles? And um, she would give me a bowl of noodles over the fence uh, as I was working on my garden or tending uh, the chickens. Fast forward again, I have a lovely partner whose family lets me be a part of his life. And his mom has also taught me. So not only did Corazon's mom teach me how to make punset, um, Ross's mother has taught me how to make punset. And this is like a combination of both of their recipes. I will note that I am going to be leaving out the chicken because I didn't want to thaw out a whole pack of chicken. Hashtag COVID cooking. Um, so I'm going to kind of make do with what I had and what I could get uh, in our grocery order. We're going to be using um, a stir frying method for this. Now, like I said, I was going to just kind of have this put together, show the stir frying of the noodles and move on because this episode's all about noodles and I wanted to focus on those noodles. However, one of my viewers training got excited that I was doing a stir fry and really wanted to see stir fry in action. So I've decided to go through the stir frying uh, process from start to finish so you can see the art of stir fry. Stir fry shouldn't be scary. The key to stir fry is temperature control. So you're going to put your aromatics in first then your longer cooking, or then your meats, then your longer cooking veggies, then your shorter cooking veggies, then any noodles or pre-cooked rice, throw that in there, and then kind of top it off with any sort of sauces or dressings that you want to top off or done. So I like to add my shrimp towards the end to warm them up, um, but I don't like to, I hate overcooked shrimp, so I like to kind of manage my shrimp by pre-cooking them and adding them in later. That's the only exception to the stir-fry rule. The other thing you're going to notice is I cut my carrots in these medallion shapes um, at an angle, so they are easier to cook, and the green beans are cut the same way, kind of in that um, perpendicular parallelogram shape trying to remember my geometry, the parallelogram shape. It just allows them to cook. So aromatics are your things like onion, um, garlic, and any spices that you're going to put in there. Put those in first. In this case, I also am using a Chinese sausage, which is going to act as an aromatic. So I have two tablespoons of grapeseed oil in here. I like grapeseed oil because it does have a higher smoking point and because you're cooking hot and fast, uh, with a stir-fry, you kind of want that 
going. So I'm going to let that get warm, let that get going. The first aromatic, as soon as this gets warm, I want to put in is my onion. This is about a quarter of a cup of onion. You can hear it sizzling. That means it was warm enough. Go ahead and put this in the sink. Give that a stir. Now, always, I always, general rule for me is wait for your onions to get translucent. Okay. Now, both Ross's mom and um, my friend Corazon's mom, when they taught me this, they like to kind of do things in steps and then compile it at the end. I'm going to try and do this in the method of a traditional stir fry, which means we keep pushing forward. I'm not going to take the ingredients out, cook the next ingredient, take that out, and then combine them back. So this may blow up in my face, but we'll see. So my onions are translucent. I'm going to now throw in my garlic, my other aromatic, and my carrots. Now, carrots can count as a vegetable, but I'm counting them as an aromatic because they're going to add a sweetness to the dish. Get these in there. Get them cooking. Carrots take a while to release their sweetness to cook down. I'm going to give them a minute in there. They're looking glossy. They're looking pretty. So I'm just keeping this moving. So not only do you want to cut your pieces in those nice, um, fast cooking um, places, but you want to have your temperature set where you constantly hear that sizzle. But you want to keep it moving because in a hot situation like this, it's going to burn. So you're going to notice I'm looking down quick. It's a little interesting cooking a stir fry this way uh, because you, you just got to keep an eye on it. Don't think I forgot. I always have to cook with a drink. I always have it at the ready. You're going to want to think of order of operations in your stir fry, which vegetables cook, you know, first. You're not going to put your kale in at the same time you put your broccoli. You know, you're going to want to put your aromatics in, then put your longer and harder to cook veggies in there next. I am going to go ahead and add my green beans now. So those carrots have kind of softened up. We're going to cook those green beans for a minute. And at this time, I probably should have put this in earlier, but this is, again, an adventure. I'm going to put my Chinese sausage in there. It's going to release some fat. It's going to cook up with that green bean and the carrot. So, again, if I were to do this again, which I'm not going to because that's a huge waste of food. But, again, this shows you relax in the kitchen. You can make mistakes and recover. It's never going to be perfect. But I would have put, I probably would have went onion, um, garlic, carrot, and this at the same time the Chinese sausage. So now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna throw in my cabbage. Just so this starts to wilt a bit. And like I said, I'm gonna kind of save my shrimps because I don't want them to overcook. So as soon as I get that cabbage tossed in, I'm going to go ahead and add my steet noodles, okay? So I'm going to add these steep noodles in here. They were steeped in chicken broth. Actually, chicken bouillon. The first time I used chicken broth, uh, Corazon's mom, I think, thought I was crazy. So those noodles are going to be wet. I'm going to add the remaining water in there, or chicken broth in there. So now I have a really wet mix. I need that wet mix because I have to stir fry these dry noodles in. So I'm going to go ahead and do that, add my dry noodles, and it's going to be this continuous adventure of kind of turning and integrating these um, dry noodles into the mix so they can kind of steam a little bit and break down a little bit. So I'm going to let them sit there. They're going to be nice and happy, though there's water in there so it's going to stop any chance at burning. So just kind of let those noodles wilt. You can already kind of hear they're starting to get soft. So now I got those going. I'm going to add my shrimps. Actually, that's a good amount of shrimps. I didn't add salt like I would normally salt as I go. I didn't add salt because, as you guessed it, I used chicken bouillon, which the recipe calls for. I'm gonna give this a taste with a fork. So 
delicious. It needs a little bit more time. Those noodles just need a little bit more love. And if I was at my actual like stove, I'd be tossing the heck out of that thing. Um, again, it just makes me feel like a mouse. So last step is going to be adding your final sauce, your teriyaki, whatever. It's usually more sugary, it's thick, and it's gonna kind of coat everything. I'm just gonna add a little bit of hoisin sauce. It was great to have in hand. It helps just, if you wanna give things like a nice quick Asian flair, hoisin sauce. We'll do it every time. And I think we're done. I'm gonna go ahead and plate. So here you have it, a Filipino noodle stir fry known as panse. Let's go ahead and take a taste. Mmm. Ah, it's there's just nothing better than panse. That just chicken saltiness flavor, the flavor of the Chinese sausage gives off. Then that hoisin sauce, so great. I actually love this um, guilty pleasure cold in the morning for breakfast. I know that sounds weird. It's delicious. And these three dishes that I gave you, just kind of like simple butter garlic noodles, uh, sapa soy, and pancet are just three dishes that ring so true for my life in, uh, and my love of noodles and that relationship I've built with noodles. Again, just like rice, noodles are versatile. The thing to fly off the shelf um, at that store is going to be pastas, noodles, um, and rice. So this is another basic dish to learn how to manipulate. You can do so much with noodles, whether it's adding it to a sauce, or something simple, a stir fry, all make fantastic dishes. So I hope you enjoyed. Ooh, she basic. All right, well, it's time to film my favorite part of the show. You did what, honey? That's right, you did what, honey? And in this segment, I'm going to use an ingredient given to me from one of the viewers uh, that's kind of a typical pantry item, and I'm going to mix it with our sort of food item of the day. So today we worked on noodles. I'm going to have to use noodles and whatever this mystery ingredient is in this dish. So I went live after the last video to kind of talk with people, and I threw out the suggestion of what do you want me to make in this episode. And I got a lot of funny, random things that were slightly inappropriate emojis, but it was pretty funny. And then one person, Wendy Mejia, suggested peanut butter. Ba -da 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 -da. Now, I originally shot her down when she said peanut butter because I said it was too easy. Um, I still stand by the fact that I think it's kind of too easy, um, especially when you get into kind of Thai cuisine. But then I realized that a lot of my viewers might not be sure how they could use peanut butter in a pasta dish. Well, technically not pasta, in a noodle dish. So... That got me going, and I want to be creative, so I'm actually, I think I'm going to try and do two dishes for you, um, and I've been kind of thinking as I've been cooking today with the video, knowing that this was coming, so um, I think I'm going to, and again, I don't look up any anything, I just kind of play it by ear. I want to show you creative cooking, so I know I have peanut butter, and I know I have noodles. So I'm thinking I want to do, because I have some leftover spring roll wrappers, so maybe spring rolls and peanut sauce. And um, kind of, I then also thought of like a dessert. I was like, oh, that could like throw them for a loop. I'll throw a dessert in there and do something different. So I think I'm going to make a dessert using the leftover like chow mein noodles and um, some... Uh, we have some butterscotch chips, and I might do like little haystack things. I'm not going to look up again. I'm not going to look up anything. I'm just going to go for it. Is every week going to be me squishing something squishy into a cup? I don't know. <laughs> but apparently that's the pattern. Always garlic. I got an okay. I got an idea. I'm gonna put a cup of spoons on the table so we can count how many spoons I have to use to taste this damn peanut sauce. Three shrimps. I'm only gonna make a couple rolls. I don't want to make a ton. We already have a lot of food. We're gonna have to eat. So we're gonna be eating pasta. 
Um, half a can of coconut milk uh, with kind of the fat in there. It's thick and creamy. I have some um, Thai like chili sauce. It's really good. It has the rooster on it like sriracha, but um, different sauce. Two cloves of garlic, half a cup of peanut butter. I'm not sure how much peanut butter I need. I'm going to go by color. I think I'm going to start by like, again, the aromatics in there, my garlic oil. Get that also hot. Get the peppers in there, then add the coconut milk, then the peanut butter for color, and then a little bit of hoisin. We'll see. Uh, ooh, fresh peanuts. <laughs> This oil's already a little bit hot. Let's get my garlic in there. Um, okay, those are starting to lightly brown. Gonna throw that in there. It's gonna pop. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Pop. Let's just fix that with coconut milk. So. If you're doing this at home let's uh one not ruin our shirt which <laughs> i did um let's get our coconut milk in there before we uh put that pepper sauce again we make mistakes in the kitchen and that's okay too thick uh especially after i had the peanut butter in there so i'm gonna add some water um just Wow, today is a day. Get my life together again. I'm frazzled. She's frazzled. Oh, I can smell that peanut butter. I can't wait. I want to taste some. I keep eyeing those spoons. I'm going to do it anyway. Spoon one, down the hatch. Mmm, good creaminess. Oh, I love the spice. Worth the splatter. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and add like a tablespoon or two of poison sauce. Okay, it's gonna add that nice, sweet, uh, rich depth of flavor. Taste number two. Remember, when in doubt, salt it out. I need to stop talking with my back turned. Salt helps us taste flavor. Without salt, it's just bland. Final test. I don't even know what spoon I'm on. That's your guys' job. So hoisin sauce has a very unique flavor and I don't wanna add any more hoisin sauce to this, but it needs a little sweetness. So I am gonna put just a smidge of brown sugar in there. And I chose brown sugar, one for its color, but two, it has a dark caramely taste compared to your refined, your standard refined sugar. Taste. There it is. That's the texture I want. Salt, sugar, nice balance, fantastic. A nice cold shrimps. Some green lettuce leaves here. Some basil. If you guys have ever wondered what your spring roll papers look like, they look like this. It literally looks and sounds like a plastic sheet. You're going to put this in warm water, and then you're going to wrap and roll your thing. This is my sheet. See those rips in it? Uh, stretch it out over my plate. I'm going to turn my plate so those rips are kind of first. That way when I roll it, they're like the first things rolled up and they're safe and secured. So I just put that on my plate. 
this is going to be impossible to see even if I did an overhead shot. First thing I'm going to lay down, I think, is my Latouche. So I'm going to go ahead and lay down some Latouche. I'm going to take the, the heart sort of out of it a little bit. It sounds really sad and graphic when you say it that way. go. Do I have enough room to wrap? Okay, now I'm going to add my noodles right on top there. Nice little nest o noodles. And because it's a noodle party, I'm going to add some of these glass noodles too. Because why not? You know, a little different texture. Oop, stringy stringy. All right. So lettuce, bed, then I'm going to lay down um, my shrimps and put the pretty side down so when you roll it, you can kind of see them. Four shrimps there. So then I'm going to roll this first lettuce over. And then I'm going to bring the sides over like a burrito. The sides come in. This side's going to come over. Then roll over that. And then the last thing I'm going to stick on here in the end are my basil leaves. So you can get a little pretty basil there towards the end. <laughs> You're going to taste this. So I'm going to taste one and then I'm going to bring Ross in and he's going to do his taste test. And I'm just going to screw the topping peanuts. Mm. Mm. Really good. The texture still isn't 100% there for me on the peanut sauce. The flavor's good. You can tell I do not roll these a lot. It's a little too loose of a roll, um, but I, you know, I was racing the clock and the time, kind of going for a double dip because it's just Ross and I. All right, so I just went and talked to Ross. He's on his way. He's gonna do a little sleigh or nay and tell us if these spring rolls are a sleigh or a nay and the peanut sauce. Ross, are you ready? Sure All right, here he is, ladies and gents. So this is a peanut sauce, and then this is a sort of a basic spring roll. Um, go ahead. Dip in. My wrap is slightly loose because, you know, I never make these. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definite slay. Um, it is a little different <clears throat> sauce wise from like uh, you know, all your typical restaurants. But uh, what do you think is different? I think it's probably like a shrimp in it. Um, it's very not more peanut butter, yeah, not just peanut, it's peanut butter. So, so oh, <laughs> look at me, I'm too tall for this. He's too tall, he's out of frame the whole time. Yeah. So a little too much peanut butter? Do you think I should mm. cut it back next time? Mm. Or do you like it? I'd probably cut it back, but maybe the next time you use a different type of peanut butter. Like what? Like that's more just peanutty. So maybe kind of like straight peanut. Sauce maybe sauce. maybe the peanut from like Rayleigh's, you know how like they have it and they freshly Okay. Ground so like peanuts. maybe some fresh ground peanut. Mm-hmm. Okay. Or maybe, yeah, maybe toasting some of the peanuts in there. Possibly. Nice, but still delicious. Oh, yeah. Still something you'd have me make again, even as is. Yes. Perfect. Just a little tighter wrap. <laughs> tighter wraps. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, don't, it, I was having wrap problems. So it is a little loose. Make sure you get that roll nice and tight. Um, don't be so afraid of the wrapper. Um, anything else? Thoughts? All feelings? Sure. All right. So, surprise. We're going to do a second dish. 
Mm -hmm. um, this is gonna be a dessert. I am going to make a dessert and I'm gonna bring you back in. Are you down? Down. Always. All right. Okay, bye. You go relax. I'm gonna get cooking. Okay. We're going to make some no-bake cookies, some um, sort of chow mein cookies or like haystack cookies or whatever you want to call them. So okay. I'm going to get going on that. I know I need my peanut butters and I need some noodles. <laughs> So I have these uh, chow mein noodles that I used. They were from the bun set and they're crunchy, but you can get through them. They're not gonna break your teeth. I also have butterscotch, chocolate chip, and some chocolate chips only because, oops, only because I didn't have enough butterscotch to fill up the cup. We're gonna heat this in the microwave. Now chocolate can burn easy in the microwave and semi-chocolate chips need to be stirred to melt. So it's in the stirring process that they'll melt a little bit. I'm only gonna do like, start off with maybe 10 second increments uh, and then I'm gonna stir. I think when a lot of people do the whole melt in the microwave method for chocolate, they end up burning their chocolate because they're waiting for it to actually melt. Um, that will not happen. You really do need to stir those chips to get them breaking down. There we go. It's nice and loose, soft. So now I need to add some peanut butter in here while this is hot. Um, but I need it to kind of like set, so I can't have as much peanut butter. I'm just gonna do like one big spoon. Mm, that's not enough. <laughs> mm. I love peanut butter. We'll do two spoons. These. All right, there we go. So now I think I just can add like a little bit of peanut in there. I don't want to go too crazy. I'm going to start folding in and kind of breaking up a little bit some of these chow mein noodles. Here they are. I'm gonna go pop them into the freezer or the fridge to maybe help them set up faster, and then we'll bring Ross in for a Slayer and A. But while I do that, we're gonna go see what's the tea, honey? This week's question is, what has been your experience with the romantic or sensual side of cooking, food, and eating? And we got a wealth, um, a wealth of, of answers. But this week, I think I wanted to start off by telling my own story or my own experience a little bit just to be fair. So I, there's two things I want to talk about. The first thing I really want to talk about is my first date with Ross. Um, we are both kind of indecisive uh, people. I didn't really know that about him at the time, but I knew that for me. And I had asked for this first date and he had accepted. And I was super nervous. I wanted to make sure it was perfect. I wanted it to be romantic. I, um, I wanted it to be like everything I wanted it to be. And so you know, I put together this picnic basket. Inside of this picnic basket had lots of different things. So I wanted to create options for different activities. So for our pregame drinks, there was a shot glass with papers in it. And he picked out one of the papers and that paper said where we were going for drinks, our pre-date drinks. But when I got time for um, dinner, I had wrapped paper in tongs of like forks and so I had five forks and I held the forks out to him and I said okay uh, whatever fork you pick is where we're going to dinner and he picked um, the fork and I believe it was it was kind of like American food we ended up going to um, like a midtown restaurant and we sat down and we enjoyed and we talked and we had such a great time um that we ended up staying, we we went out, we played at an arcade, we ended up at um, Gold and Silver, this 
dive bar, er, not dive bar, this dive restaurant in Reno, and we spent um, till like two in the morning, three in the morning, having coffee and pie and hot chocolate and just talking and getting to know each other. And I really, like none of, neither of us would have said it then because it was the first date, but I really like, that's where I knew that this person was special. The second thing I wanted to talk to you guys about was like big people problems. So if you are a bigger person, you know about it when it comes to dates and eating, right? The pre-eat. Yeah, that's right. Big people be pre-eating out here because people be judging us <laughs> for eating. Um, when it comes to like romance and dating, like as much as I like to express with food and give people food as a gift and to show my love and my appreciation, I also am like afraid of my eating habits and being bigger because people judge you when you're big. They automatically assume you eat a ton um, and, and all of these things. So like a huge part of my relationship world was like hiding my eating habits. So before I went on a date, I would eat and then not order anything on the date or just order like a side salad or something small. Um, so I wasn't hungry, but also, um, that they didn't have to see me or watch me. And it took me years to get over that. Uh, the comment of the week on the Facebook page, uh, goes to Becca Henry. It's brilliant. And it made me laugh out loud. She writes, Becca Henry writes, you mean like that time I had sexual feelings towards a picture of a cheese cake? Um, just kidding, mom. I love <laughs> <laughs> that idea. I have had a very physically emotional reaction to cheesecake, so I feel you, girl, on that one. The only thing that would have made that better for me is why it gotta be a picture. Why can't it be the real? I would set that cheesecake in front of me and just have my moment. Um, you go in, girl. All right, and then Stacy Johnson comes in with the, the comment, I've never found certain foods um, and connected them to be sensual, but the person behind the food. If a man can mow like a cheeseburger in under five minutes, I am here for it. Or if he can put it back and out eat me, I'm here for it as well. A ton of people were like, say me too, I love that. And so this was a re refreshing for me as uh, refreshing, refreshing, uh, refreshing for me as someone who had eating issues, especially in a dating environment, to see people be like, oh my God, I love someone with an appetite. That's amazing when somebody can just kind of eat and be themselves while they're eating. So I really appreciated that comment. It hit me in my heartstrings a little bit because, uh, you know, that, that kind of shame or guilt around food that I think we sometimes build in these relationship capacities. Um, let's keep rolling forward. So some of the comments talked about um, that idea of showing love and expressing, expressing love. And that came up a lot for me in filming and thinking about this episode when I did the um, Ushi basic sequence and the noodles and looking at cooking all of these noodles. It all came back to people m making noodles for me or me feeling special parts for these noodles because they were like a gift and they were important um, and given to me. And a few people really talked about that. Jamie Lynn Ritchie uh, writes, or Ritchie writes, I love cooking for other people. I enjoy the process of gathering the ingredients and making something. I hardly ever use a recipe exactly as it's written. It's madness to only use one clove of garlic. Anyhow, there is something intimate about sitting around with your family or friends and just eating a meal you prepared. The satisfying sounds of fork on plate scraping up the last morsel of yummy. I just, that and to me is the essence of like eating and food is the things you share. It's a gift, it's a present, it's something you give your family, it's something you give your friends and they share that moment with you in return and there's nothing better than that. It, it's so human, that reaction. I flip in, just, I love, I love all of that. Um, Jamie, love every moment of that. Uh, Lauren Huft comes in. If you saw my live video, she did the cool tie-dye hoodie, tie-dye queen, brilliant. I love her stuff. She came in and said, I have food allergies, celiac with a bonus. I dated a guy who researched what I had. He planned cooking dates so he could cook for me with no issues. That was such a turn on. 
how positive, you know, Lauren, to have somebody who's really listening to your needs. And I mean, isn't that what eating is too? In, in, in at the end of the day, it's our dietary needs. We need sustenance. We need these things. And so when someone can provide that in a way that shows that they care about you, how romantic. However, Lauren added a second story of a not so positive interaction with food. The last serious relationship I had didn't believe me. It wasn't until I woke up with a dizzy spell side effect that he confessed that he didn't believe me and tested to see what would happen if he just snuck something into the meal. I, I cannot stress how utterly dangerous that is. I am shook at that. And I know some people might read that um, casually and not think of it as a big deal, but my brother has horribly, horribly dead just deadly food allergies he's allergic to chicken turkey i mean you name it he is allergic to it it is my fear every time i cook that i am going to accidentally cross contaminate something and get him sick the dangers of doing that i can't believe someone would do that just to try it and sneak it in like he did not know the severity of your allergic reactions and what that meant for you and what that could mean. Sometimes it could be two and three days. Sometimes it's a hospital visit. Sometimes it's an EpiPen. Please do not screw around with people. Um, ask people their allergies. Be considerate of that because it is not a fun world when you have to deal with those um, things. Um, another one is... is uh, and so... This is kind of a fun question to assess our relationships with food. And this whole episode is about kind of human relationship with food, but also like personal relationship with food and how they attach to emotions and feelings. Um, but it is a, a relationship and things don't always go well. And, and, and the same things for cooking. When I'm in the kitchen, not everything goes the way I want it to. Not everything can go the way I want it to, but I, I have to choose to either deal with it in that moment or kind of assess where it went wrong. Um, just like relationships, my relationship with food, my working with food, um, it's something that takes work and time and practice. And you know what that means? That's the tea, honey. All right, so here they are, our little bird nest uh, chow mein noodle cookies. Um, I'm really excited about them, let's taste. Mm. Sweet, salty, that butterscotch is nice, the peanut's nice. Really good. All right, let's bring in Ross. Let's see if this is a sleigh or nay. Ross. Choose your cookie. All right. So they have uh, butterscotch, chocolate, peanuts. And peanut butter. Yeah, that's good. Definitely slay. Oh. I was uh, a little worried because using chow mein noodles is just a very weird thing. <clears throat> and especially the, the ones you use. Yeah, because your mom makes these cookies, right? Right, but with just... A different kind of chow mein, I would but say. But it's like not a real uh, noodle, right? No, it's like more of like a salad topping. Mm. So what do you think? Because your mom uses way more chocolate. This barely has any chocolate. It's more peanut um, oriented. What do you think? I was going to say the peanut butter is nice. It's a nice addition. I think it softens the cookie a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes when you use just all chocolate, it can get really hard. Yeah. And she does use a lot, a lot more chocolate. Butter. So both for a sleigh. Thank you, Wendy, for peanut butter. I thought that was unique. If you have a pantry ingredient you want me to try, please watch my videos, comment, leave me a message on the FB, and we'll see what we can do. If you guys enjoyed my video, thank you for watching. If you liked it, please subscribe to Ghostlight TV.